St. Paul of the Cross is a founder of the Congregation of the Passion, or the Passionists, that's the order to which Father Pat and Father Peter and I belong. And so I'd like to share with you some elements of St. Paul's life, Paul of Cross's life, uh, which speak about chaos and speak about living faithfully. Um, so Paul of Cross was named Paul Danio, and he was born in a little town in northwestern Italy called Ovada in 1694. He was the second of 16 children. But out of that 16, only six lived to be adults. And so you can see early on, he knew the chaos of grief and he knew the chaos of loss, you know, and, and losing members of the family. His father was a tobacco merchant and not very successful. So uh, the family moved around a lot as the father tried to establish a successful business. You know, and, and in some of our older places, or some of our older places that we live, you know, you can see heritage or legacy of Paul across having a tobacco merchant as a father because in some of the older monasteries, you know, in the choirs, there was a little box for snuff. But Paul across used snuff, so I guess people pass this later on and well, I guess if he used snuff, we ought to use snuff too or something like that. I don't know. I, re I remember when I was uh, in the Vishit, you know, when we get vested with the habit, it's a hand-me-down habit from somebody who's, you know, in the past. So, uh, but I love my division habit because uh, not only did it have slits for the go into the pockets of my pants, it had pockets itself. It had this little pocket that this one still has here. and even had a pocket for the pack of cigarettes right in here. <laughs> but anyway, um, but the family had to move around a lot. And not only that, um, you know, I say Ovada is a town in northwestern Italy. Well, in 1694, Italy wasn't Italy. There was no Italy. There was a lot of different little kingdoms and principalities and fiefdoms and dukedoms and all sorts of things like that. But that part of Europe was a battleground sometimes for some of the bigger empires in Europe, you know, fighting over territory. So not only did they have to move around because his father tried to establish a successful business, but he had to move around because sometimes there would be battles and wars going on. And you know, of course, that's chaos. You know, we see that chaos today. It still boggles my mind when I watch the news and I think that there are literally millions of refugees in our world. Literally millions of people who have left their homeland trying to find a better life, trying to find safety, trying to find freedom from oppression, freedom from poverty, freedom from terror, freedom from violence. You know, millions of people. And it's chaos. It's chaos. And then, uh, also, when we look at the time in which St. Paul lived, uh, there was chaos in the church. Um, those of you who know, uh, well, maybe some of you who like church history, you know that when the, when the Protestants, you know, when Martin Luther left the church and, and the other Protestants left the church and so forth and so on, you know, because of, they wanted to reform, uh, you know, the church sought to reform itself. So they had the Council of Trent in the 16th century. Uh, but by the time that St. Paul across from around, those, those reforms had kind of, you know, kind of lost steam. And there were a lot of people, even though they were nominally Catholic, who were really basically unchurched or really didn't, you know, really weren't churched or really much that much knowledgeable about their faith. And even the priests, there were a lot of priests around who really weren't all that motivated and really weren't all that dedicated. So, so here's Paul the Cross living in, you know, the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, and he sees war, he sees the loss of uh, a family, and he sees having to move around, and he sees the church really not, you know, all that alive. And that's the chaos in which he lived. 
So he grew up, and as a young man, he heard this sermon, he heard this homily by a parish priest, and it changed his life. It changed his life because after that homily, he, he got inspired that he needed to do something with his life. He, needed, he wanted to dedicate his life to God. He felt called to dedicate his life to God. But he didn't know how that was going to be. He didn't know what he was supposed to do. All he knew was that he needed, he wanted, he was called to live a dedicated life. So shortly after this happened, the Turks had invaded the city of Venice and the Pope of that day called for a kind of latter day crusade. And so Paul thought, well, maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Maybe I'm supposed to go and fight in this crusade, you know, fight for Mother Church, fight for the city of Venice, you know, fight for Christianity, whatever it, you know, however it might be. So he goes and he joins the troops and he, and he goes and, uh, where the troops are and he prays a bit and he says, well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to do. But he's still searching. He's still searching. And you know, to me, that's a kind of chaos. You know, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of <laughs> knowing that what you're leaving but not sure what you're going to. <laughs> and, you know, it can be pretty chaotic. You know, I remember my own experience. Uh, uh, a lot of you, if I see if you're new here, a lot of you don't know my story, but uh, before I joined the Passionists, I worked as a chemical engineer in uh, Southern Illinois. I was born and raised in New Jersey. I got a degree in chemical engineering from Ohio U in Athens and went back to New Jersey looking for a job and the job that they hired me for was in actually Carbondale, Illinois. I never heard of Carbondale, Illinois. Carbondale is actually a college town, so the Illinois University is there. And I went to the Newman Center, the Catholic Student Center, SIU, instead of the parish in town because I was just out of college myself. And a little bit after, after I arrived at Carbondale, so did the Passionists. And I became involved in a church, really, for the first time in my life. And, you know, a lot of things that happened, and, you know, I think God gave me hints along the way, and so forth and so on. One year, I was invited to a vocation retreat during Holy Week. And because Carbondale actually became kind of like the residence where passionate students were in our province before they went to Novitiate, that was really convenient for me, because I already lived in town, so... I was just invited to go to this vocation retreat during Holy Week. Some of you remember Father Jack Conley? Well, oh, Father Jack was a vocation director then, so uh, he uh, directed the retreat. And I went on this retreat. My usual mode of doing things at that time was, before I commit to anything, I want to be 100% absolutely, positively sure this was the right thing to do. Something's told me that that wasn't going to work. <laughs> and as I prayed during the retreat, I kind of realized that if I didn't look into religious life, even though I wasn't sure, if I didn't look into it, I'd regret it for the rest of my life. So I told Father Jack at the end of the retreat, well, you know, I think I'm interested. <laughs> so at the beginning of formation was I still worked full time. At the, at the plant that I worked, it, we made adhesive tape, the little company that I worked for made adhesive tape. And, um, but I went to see a passionist on a regular basis. His name was Father Joe Van Leeuwen, who uh, unfortunately just passed away. So I met with Father Joe and so forth and so on, and I would pray and I would, you know, talk and try to discern and whatever, but, you know, it still wasn't clear to me. It wasn't clear to me. And, and that really got frustrating after a while, you know. I want my life to be directed by Steven Spielberg. <laughs> or Michael Bay, or J.J. Abrams, or somebody, you know. I want the clouds to part. I want the voice from heaven to say, Phil, do this. Phil, go there. You know, didn't happen. <laughs> Hasn't happened. I got a feeling it's not going to happen. <laughs> so here I am, kind of like, dealing with this, trying to figure out, getting frustrated about not knowing and, you know, not having it revealed to me right away. And Father Jack came for a visit and he wanted to see how I was doing. So he took a walk and we were talking and I was telling him all this. And he said, well, Phil, you know, sometimes you have to stay in the mess. 
Thanks a lot, Jay. <laughs> but sometimes we have to stay in the chaos because we're maybe not quite ready to go where God wants us to go, or whatever it might be. But, you know, I, I, I wonder whether Paul the Cross felt the same thing, because here he is searching, he's searching. And during this time, he's kind of drawn to a life of solitude, trying to drawn to a life of poverty. And then it became, you know, clearer and clearer to him, because he began to receive what, what he would call intellectual visions. It isn't that Mary appeared to him in, in bodily form in front of him or something like that, but he had these intellectual visions, visions in his mind of either, you know, Mary calling him to gather companions to promote the memory of the passion of Jesus. And it fit into what he saw in his world. Because I think when Paul the Cross looked at the chaos in his world, where he looked at what was going on in his family, when he looked at what was going on in where he lived, and we look at what was going on in the church, you know, I think it was akin to Jesus, you know, what we read in the gospel, what Jesus saw when he saw the crowds. That they were tired and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. And I think maybe that's how Paul the Cross saw the people of his day, tired and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. And for him, the reason it came to him is because people had forgotten. People had forgotten how much God loved them. And he thought, he saw that the best way to remind people about how much God loved them was to promote the memory of the passion of Jesus. Because when Paul the cross looked at the cross, when he looked at the crucifixion of Jesus, yeah, he saw the physical pain, and yes, he saw the blood and the sweat and, and the anguish, the physical anguish that Jesus was suffering, but more, even more than that, Paul saw love. He saw God's love for the people. And that's what he wanted to remind the people. He wanted to remind them, don't forget God loves you. And this is how much God loves you. And that's what he wanted to share with the world. That's what he wanted to share with the people of his time. Not to forget, but to remember God's love. And so he developed a relationship with this bishop who kind of, you know, kind of tried to mentor him and so forth and so on, let him wear the, the garb of a hermit. And and then so soon after this, he takes a retreat pretty much during the advent of the season from the end of November to you know, past Christmas, a 40-day retreat. And during that 40-day retreat, he writes the first rule of the congregation. Now, you know, religious orders, we all, all religious orders kind of live by what we call a rule. Franciscans have a rule and the Benedictines have a rule and, and so forth. So we passionists have a rule that we live by. And, uh, you know, it's evolved over the centuries, but, you know, in that year, when he was about 27 or so, like that, he had, on this 40-day retreat, he wrote down the rule. Unfortunately, we don't have a copy of that rule. We don't have that down in writing. But we do have his diary that he wrote during this 40-day retreat. And in this diary, he talks about, you know, writing the rule you know, just kind of flowing out of his pen. It was like the Spirit was guiding him and so forth and so on. And he wrote the rule in five days. Not long after that, he kind of realizes, well, in order for me to get started, I need to go to Rome and get it disapproved. So that's what he did. He said, well, I'll just go to Rome. I'll pop in at the Vatican, see the Pope, get approved and get going. So that's what he does. He goes to the Vatican, knocks on the door, and says, I want to see the Pope. And the Swiss Army guy says, yeah, so does everybody else. So they kick him out because he's dressed poorly and they figure he's just another beggar looking for a handout, so they kick him out. And, you know, all, pretty much all his biographers point to this. This is a very important moment in his life because what does he do? What does he do? 
Because think about it, here you are, you're inspired. You're inspired. You are totally convinced that this is coming from God. This call to gather companions to promote the memory of the passion of Jesus is coming from God. It's from God. It's God's work. It's what you were meant to do. And you can't even get started. You get rejected. You don't even get a chance to make your pitch. You don't even get a chance to state your case. So what does he do? Well, he doesn't give up. He doesn't say, well, I guess that's that. And, you know, I guess I got to figure out something else to do. He doesn't give up. It looks like he doesn't get angry. You know, he doesn't say, well, this is stupid. I'll just start my own church so I can do this if I have to. What he does is that the Basilica of St. Mary Major is nearby and he goes in to pray. And Paul was a man of prayer. Man of prayer. Everything, whatever happened, whatever was going on, he prayed. And he rededicated himself to the vision. He rededicated himself to promote the memory of the passion of Jesus Christ. In that chaos of rejection, in that chaos of not getting started, he, he strove to be faithful. Be faithful to the vision that God gave him. And he kept on. And eventually, he got verbal approval from Rome and he was able to start gathering companions and so forth and so on. For a long time, it was just he and his brother, John Baptist. And that chaos of rejection, you know, can be pretty powerful. You know, in my life as a passionist, in my ministerial life, um, there was a time I was let go of a position that I held. You know, and intellectually, I could see the value of it. You know, intellectually, I could, you know, you know, in human resource jargon, I didn't have the total skill set for the job or whatever you want to call it. You know, so I can understand why I was let go, but it still hurt. It hurt. It felt like a failure, you know. And I didn't know what to do. You know, so I prayed, you know, my provincial superior said, well, it's up to you. You can stay where you are or you can go someplace else and I'll leave it up to you. But it might be good if you stayed where you were. So I had to think about that and pray about that some more. I talked to some people and I think God blessed me with people who did not feel sorry for me. <laughs> because they basically told me, Phil, it doesn't matter what position you've got. What matters is whether you're serving God or not whether you're serving the people or not. So I prayed about that, and I heard that, and I, you know, stayed where I was. Well, obviously in a different kind of role, but I stayed where I was. Now, sometimes, a lot of times in the world, we don't have a whole lot of choice. We either get fired or we get laid off or we get whatever, or, or the company is downsized, or you know the position is eliminated, or whatever it might be, you know whatever version it might be, you know we don't have a choice about staying or going. But whether we stay or go, uh, the important thing is about you know being faithful, serving God. You know, Paul encountered a lot of setbacks in his life. And yet, he always trusted in God. And one of the things about his spirituality, now, he wasn't, he wasn't a great spiritual writer in a sense like Alphonsus Liguori or some of the other ones, or Francis de Sales, or other people who wrote these, you know, these spiritual treatises. He wasn't a theologian who wrote theological books or so forth and so on. What he did was he did a lot of spiritual direction and he did a lot of it by letter. Actually, he had requested the people that he wrote letters to, to to destroy them after he died. Well, some of them didn't obey him, lucky for us. And uh, actually, there are three red books. I can't see them from here, but next to the blue books of Butler's Lives of the Saints, there are three volumes of his letters translated into English. And one of the things, there were a lot of things that he would tell people. He would talk always talk about surrendering to God's will. 
he would talk about praying without ceasing, and he would talk about taking everything from the loving hand of God. And that meant the good and the bad and the in-between. You know, and I think that is the toughest part of his spirituality that I try to grapple with. What does it mean to take everything from the loving hand of God? You need to take the suffering, to take the pain, everything from the loving hand of God? What does that mean? Because that message can be perverted, it can be twisted in so many bad ways. You know, sometimes, you know, there have been times when maybe a woman in an abusive situation has come to me and there's something telling her, her friends are telling her, her therapist is telling her, her counselor is telling her to get out, leave, you know, take the kids, make sure everybody's safe. You know, but she hears something like this, or she hears Jesus say, whoever wants to come after me must take up their cross, deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And so she thinks, well, maybe this is my cross. I'm supposed to, you know, to stay in this abusive situation. That's my cross that I'm supposed to bear. And I find myself telling somebody like that, no, that's, God isn't asking you to put your life in danger unnecessarily. God isn't asking you to be miserable unnecessarily. Maybe the cross you have to bear is going out on your own for a while. Or taking the risk to actually leave, to leave. Or sometimes when I look at the history of humanity, and you know, when you think about, you know, people from Europe or, or artists from Europe or whatever, you know, coming to Africa, coming to Asia, coming to the Americas or whatever, and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes oppressing the native peoples, you know, and when they go, they bring, you know, sometimes they bring the, the priests with them or the missionaries with them, and the missionaries teach the natives the faith, you know, but then it becomes kind of uh, convenient for the powers to say, well, this is your cost to bear. <laughs> you, uh, you, you people, that's your cost to bear to be oppressed. Your reward will be great in heaven, okay? But for now, uh, we got to oppress you. <laughs> Our cost will be getting rich off of you or something or whatever, I don't know. But, but it's a perversion of the message. It's not what God intends. God doesn't intend injustice. God doesn't intend people to suffer unnecessarily. So what does it mean to take everything from the loving hand of God? And the only thing I can come up with is just the realization that when we choose to love someone outside of ourselves, crosses will come, suffering will come, and we're not to run away from it. We're not to run away from it. Society wants to run away from the cross. But we can't run away from it. But somehow we must take up the cross and keep on loving and keep on giving. You know, and, and to keep on serving. And I've seen in the people's lives where they have undergone some incredible suffering in their life, or they have experienced some incredible loss, and it hasn't pushed them away from God, but it's brought them closer to God. And I think that's what Paul Cross is talking about, that somehow it brings you closer to God. Somehow, sometimes, I mean, so there, there's sometimes suffering people's lives that as much as, as, as hard as I may try to explain it, I can't explain it. And I can't find a reason for it. But sometimes, sometimes I can look at it and sometimes I can say, okay, this is God saying, don't trust in anything except me. Don't even trust in your health. Don't trust in anything. Just trust in me. Because another part of Paul's thing was detachment. You would call it detachment. You know, it's kind of a religious talk or whatever. It's, but it basically means you let go of anything that is not of God. And you just focus solely on God. 
So anyway, Paul Cross, you know, tried to establish the congregation at different places and so forth and so on. You know, people were, you know, uh, impressed, awed by his preaching and his, and his heartfelt desire, you know, to speak about the passion of Jesus. And, you know, slowly the congregation grew, but still he encountered difficulties, he encountered chaos. You know, and at that time in the church, religious orders got pretty much most of their income, so to speak, or most of the resources that they could do, whatever they were called to do, by begging. You know, so if you read some church history book and you find the word mendicant, or phrase mendicant order, that's what it means, orders went around begging. Yeah. So when Paul Cross got started, sometimes he would enter a place or whatever, and there was already another religious order there. And they would say, wait a minute. <laughs> You trying to come lately? Oh no, no, this is this is this is <laughs> this is our turf. Don't don't come in here. And in fact, one of the biographers talks about, you know, that he started a foundation, he started building, and some other religious order got a hold of the mayor or the bishop or both or whatever, and so Paul Cross gets this letter, tear down what you built, stop building, tear down what you built, and leave. Chaos again. Here you are. You're thinking you're doing God's work. Why am I getting all this trouble from these other people? You know, eventually, you know, it was overturned. He was able to start building again. But, you know, again, some more chaos. You know, sometimes where he started was very difficult for the passionists there. Sometimes they lived hand to mouth themselves. But the congregation grew. He didn't... Uh, so it goes on, but there's one another aspect of chaos that I really like to, to talk to you about, and that's kind of a spiritual chaos. Uh, do you remember when Mother Teresa got canonized? You know, I remember, I remember going online and, and the homepage of MSN or whatever, and there was this, this a controversy surrounding Mother Teresa's canonization. You know, and one of the bullet points under that was, you know, she had a period of prayer where, you know, she wasn't close to God and she didn't feel anything in prayer and so forth and so on. And the implication to me was that they were kind of implying that um, this was a disqualification. A disqualification for her being canonized because she had this prayer when she felt, you know, she felt apart from God, she wasn't close to God. And I said to myself, that's not a disqualification. You know, the fact that she remained faithful even though she couldn't feel anything, that was a qualification to me. And it's the same thing that happened in the life of Paul Cross. He went for decades in prayer without feeling anything, without having any kind of a great feeling of the closeness of God. And so, you know, that kind of came into the spiritual direction because people would write to him and say, Father Paul, Father Paul, I've had this wonderful experience of God. I've had this experience of God where I felt God, you know, put his arms around me. I could feel like I could almost reach out and touch him. I, he felt so close and I felt so reassured and I felt so comforted and I felt so loved. But the feeling is gone. How do I get it back? He would say, don't try. You say, don't try to get it back. You've had this wonderful experience. Thank God you've had this wonderful experience, but don't try to get it back. And then he would say something very important. He would say, don't focus on the gift, but on the giver of the gift. The mountaintop experience, that was a gift, but it's still not the giver of the gift. Focus on the giver of the gift. So every once in a while someone comes to me, the same thing. Father, I had this great experience of God but it's gone. How do I get it back? And I say the same thing Paul across said. Don't try. <laughs> Don't try. Because Paul was into just surrendering everything, letting go of everything that wasn't God. Just to focus on God. And sometimes, you know, we can even get attached to feelings, even though they're spiritual feelings, even though we think they're, you know, sacred feelings, that we get so attached to them that we still lose focus on God. I remember hearing in a meeting once something very true, someone very wise said, feelings are real, but they don't necessarily reflect the truth. <laughs> and so, 
Paul would say, don't even get attached to the feelings. Just try to get more and more attached to God. And so at the end of his life, you know, Paul, Paul got the approval. We got, were able to take the vows and so forth and so on. At the end of his life, his own health kind of failed. He was a man in his youth who walked everywhere, walked for miles and miles and miles. And then at his old age, he couldn't get around too much. He lived to be fairly old for those times, 81 years old. You know, he felt that closeness again to God. So for me, he is a great example of living in chaos. Chaos in the family, chaos in the church, chaos in his own spiritual life. And he remained faithful. He always put his trust in God, always talked about surrendering to God's will, surrendering to the love of God. He gave everything from the loving hand of God. So I just want to end with um, passing out these cards. Take one and pass it on. Take one and pass it on. On the front is a sketch. You know, we think of the likeness of Paul across, and it says feast day October 20th. Well, he actually died on October 18th. And um, October 18th is St. Luke's feast day, so okay, I'm going to go and work. Everywhere else in the world is October 19th, but October 19th in the U.S. and Canada is a feast day of Isaac Jogues and John de Brebeuf and the North American martyrs. So the feast was actually suppressed in the U.S. and Canada on the 19th, and so we got permission to do it on the 20th here in the U.S. So that's why the feast day is October 20th. On the back is a quote from one of the letters that I talked about before. Do the things you have to do. Work, but without haste and anxiety. Work diligently, but with peace of heart and quiet spirit, remaining in the presence of God. And for me, this is a great quote to use for this weekend because Paul realized with people that he was writing to and people that he was directing, you know, he realized, you know, he was trying to tell them, do the things you have to do. I understand that you have obligations. I understand that you have responsibilities, so forth. So go ahead and do that and work. Do the work that you have to do. But don't try, you know, to be something that you're not. Sometimes married men would write to him and say, you know, why? Well, yeah, I'm living like a monk now. And St. Paul would say, but you're not a monk. <laughs> You're a husband, you're a father. That's what you're supposed to be doing. That's your vocation. Live that out. You know? But we work down you with peace of heart and quiet spirit. You know, Paul the cross would follow Paul the Apostle, talking about praying without ceasing. But for Paul the cross, it didn't mean that you were on your knees 24-7. And what it meant was that there was some part of you that was always attuned to God, always attuned to what God may be saying to you, always attuned to how God may be working in your life. And so, in a way, everything becomes a prayer. Everything becomes a prayer. And so, and this is work done with pizza, heart, and quiet spirit, remaining in the presence of God. The motto that we passionists have, that was a, a phrase that Paul Cross used pretty much at the end of every letter that he wrote. May the passion of Jesus Christ be always in our hearts.